how did America become involved in, in medical error? Well, during most of the 20th century, at least, we, we venerated doctors and hospitals. I see some uh, people here who look like they're seniors, and they will remember how doctors were portrayed, doctors and hospitals and uh, were portrayed on the Marcus Welby show or by Norman Rockwell. All doctors were considered to be uh, uh, wise, competent, uh, not in a hurry, uh, and thoughtful. And they would get to the root of the problem, we thought. Hospitals were considered to be charitable institutions. That's why we didn't tax them uh, starting bet uh, before World War II. Uh, uh, they were thought to be charitable, ins charitable institutions. Clean, quiet, competent, safe places. Well, that started to change. And it started to change in the late 20th century. Some of the changes came from very well publicized celebrity cases. Some very prominent people suddenly died, uh, uh, generating a lot of news. One was John Wayne. He went for a routine colonoscopy at Harvard, of all places, and they missed cancerous polyps, and he died. Andy Warhol, the most prominent uh, artist in America, um, went into the best hospital in New York City, New York Hospital, for routine gallbladder surgery. He's a healthy 58-year-old man, and he died due to poor, it appears to be poor aftercare of uh, over irrigation with the fluids that were in him, that were uh, uh, piped into him. Um, uh, Ronald Reagan uh, was the victim of an attempted assassination, but because his medical care was not handled properly, uh, there was an, an accident requiring serious emergency lung surgery, and he almost died uh, from malpractice. Uh, some of the older uh, members of the audience may remember a, uh, a famous uh, journalist of his time, a columnist in New York City named Sidney Zion, a real uh, uh, crusading uh, 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 pundit, uh, columnist, and uh, his 18-year-old daughter, Libby Zion, in 1984, uh, went to the hospital in New York, basically healthy, 18-year-old. Uh, 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 she had a 102-degree fever. Uh, she um, had some uh, uh, jerking type movements. Well, she went in there, there were no full-fledged attending physicians in the hospital, just overworked, underslept residents. So they managed her rather than treated her. They restrained her uh, and they uh, uh, created a uh, uh, medication error uh, with uh, uh, an antispasmodic and a, uh, the mixture of an antispasmodic and a, uh, um, an opi opioid, and she was dead in the morning. Now, Sidney Zion was, would not sit still for this, and uh, uh, he filed every type of lawsuit you could, including uh, for a trial on court TV. Some of you may remember court TV. Uh, famous trials were on court TV for a while, and then, then they weren't, for the most part. But anyhow, this trial was, and uh, New York State started to look at the conditions of residents and found that they were working basically endlessly. They were great profit centers for hospitals because you could pay them uh, low wages, and you could, you could work them around the clock. And as a result, 
of uh, the crusade uh, by Sidney Zion. There's something called the Libby Zion Law in New York, which means no resident can work more than 24 hours straight. It seems like too much, but that's a reform. No resident can work more than 80 hours in a week. That sounds like a lot, but that's a reform. And perhaps more important, residents are treated or should be treated like airline pilots. If they feel sick for any reason, they have the right, the human right, if you will, to call off. They don't have to uh, participate. They don't have to do their shifts. They don't have to participate in surgeries. They can just take off. So that was, that was a major reform. There was another case that I'll talk about, the case of, uh, that was very, very prominent. Uh, in 1994, this focused the, the country's attention on medical error. The medical writer of the Boston Globe uh, was a young mother named Betsy Lehman, a very fine medical writer. Uh, and uh, she had cancer, and she went into a very highly regarded hospital called the Dana-Farber Cancer Center uh, in Boston, uh, where she had her bone marrow transplant. And then afterwards, she was given uh, probably, I'd say, about 16 times the dose of uh, cytoxin, uh, a chemotherapeutic agent that she should have been given. Uh, she uh, survived the transplant, uh, started to vomit up pieces of her own guts, and died. Well that this could happen, that this type of a medication error could be approved and ratified by distinguished doctors and oncology nurses caused a furor. And uh, many were fired at Dana-Farber, at Dana and Dana-Farber implemented what became a leader in automated uh, dosage warning controls. They hadn't had them before. Now you should have them when you go into a hospital and if they're going to order an overdose, the machine will print out uh, a warning. At that time it would, was a skull, skull and, cross, and crossbones. I don't know what most of the modern ones are uh, today. Uh, at Duke University Hospital, Duke Medical Center in, in 20, 2003, and again, these were national cases. Some of you may, may have heard of them, but they riveted our attention on these errors. It was a uh, young, illegal, if you will, undocumented immigrant girl from Mexico. Her family crossed illegally so that she could get uh, medical care for her heart condition, which, um, uh, her heart, her heart would never function well. It wouldn't pump properly ever. So uh, she became a candidate for a heart-lung block to be transplanted in her. It was a very serious operation, obviously. A lot of controversy because these so-called blocks are quite rare. And uh, the nation we had a national debate about whether an illegal immigrant should get this type of uh, uh, organ system uh, over a real citizen. And it became, it, it focused the media uh, and the talking heads and the ethicists and so forth. Well, she got the transplant, and it was successful, but it didn't match her blood type. No one had checked. Uh, uh, they found the organs in the uh, uh, National Organ Harvesting Donation System. It was the right size for a 12-year-old girl. It wasn't the right blood type. So her antibodies attacked this block 
and it had to be removed. And then the surgeon said, let's get her another one. And they found another one with the right blood type. And the, of course, the debate went on and on. And uh, uh, she, uh, her system was pretty much shot. And she unfortunately died. But now we have uh, more checking systems. After the, after the Santillan uh, disaster, uh, the head of uh, the Federal Agency uh, for Healthcare Research and Quality called AHRQ, which is a good agency, but very underfunded and not particularly powerful, it looks into things like medical error. Her name was Carolyn Clancy. She said at the time, it occurs to me that there's more double checking and systematic avoidance of mistakes at Starbucks than at most healthcare institutions. True at the time. So, but there has been some change in the culture such that now we um, uh, do a, a vast amount of double checking uh, uh, and everybody knows the roles that they must play particularly in a surgical uh, arena uh, and everybody checks on everybody else and that's a good thing at Johns Hopkins and some of you may have heard of another little girl named Josie King Josie King uh, also, as with some of these other people, changed the world. Josie King, uh, uh, her family was wealthy. Uh, uh, that's no uh, uh, bar against medical error. They had just moved into a new home in the Baltimore area. Uh, it was a beautiful, renovated farmhouse in the, in the suburbs. Uh, her grandmother came, uh, uh, took a bubble bath. Little Josie went in the bathroom at the time, saw the bubbles, was entranced by them. Grandma got out, went down to help fix dinner. Uh, there were screams from the bathroom upstairs. Josie, who was precocious, turned on the hot water and got in. Um, she was rushed with second and third degree burns over most of her body uh, to Johns Hopkins, uh, a, a miraculous medical center, probably the most famous in terms of children's care in the United States. Uh, she had uh, skin grafts and uh, uh, successfully uh, survived her burns and was set to go home. Unfortunately, she, her, her antibiotics were not properly managed, so she got an infection from that. Uh, she had a problem with uh, um, pain control with, with opioids, uh, and uh, she was not being hydrated properly. Um, uh, Johns Hopkins, as good as it was, was doing a very crude measure of uh, uh, hydration, which is called, and, and, and uh, evacuation, called ins and outs. They were weighing her waste versus her intake, very crude. There are better tests. You've all had them. Uh, 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 and uh, that, that uh, show dehydration. Uh, at some point, she was uh, sucking on her washcloth. She wasn't getting enough from water, the little water and ice chips they were giving her. Uh, a nurse tried to get a doctor to come see her. Chain of command was such that the doctor didn't come. Uh, I guess, I don't know why, sometimes doctors don't come, sometimes you can't get them. So the, the, she died and Hopkins, J. 
Johns Hopkins, uh, to its credit, uh, had a brilliant uh, uh, critical care anesthesiologist uh, with a public health orientation named Peter Pronovost. You may have heard of him. He's the most prominent anti-error doctor in the United States because of this case, investigate. He didn't pull any punches, and he wrote, uh, uh, Josie died of a third world disease, dehydration, in the best hospital in the world, his hospital. Uh, and he and Josie King's mother started to uh, lecture on patient safety. Uh, now there were, it wasn't just dehydration that, that killed Josie King. She also had uh, two infections, one from poor antibiotic management. The other was from something called a central line associated bloodstream infection. Central lines, as many of you know, deliver vital medicines and nutrients into patients, but Hopkins made a mistake. It hooked up her central line in her groin area in what is known as the femoral site. The femoral site is a, a place of great infection. Uh, so, so Josie died of a combination of those things. Uh, Peter Pronovost went on to be the great reformer in this country in a technical area where infections were uh, basically expected. It was just expected in hospitals that a certain percentage of people who have central lines will become infected by them. This is one of the problems with, with healthcare. There's, there's complacency. Some things are just expected to happen. Infections, patient, elderly patients having delirium, some of them falling, uh, a certain amount of, of, of mistakes, surgical site infections, wrong side surgeries, things of that nature. It's, it's been a given for a long time. Peter Pronovo said no. He actually studied uh, 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 central uh, line associated bloodstream infections uh, uh, at Hopkins and around the country and found that there was, at Hopkins, by the way, the great hospital, 11% uh, of central line patients were, were getting infected. In the United States, it was about 4% uh, uh, at the time. So the great hospital, and this is often true of teaching hospitals, just assumed it was better. It was not. So what Peter Pronovos did was he developed a bundle for eliminating central line infections. Sometimes these are called best practices. Sometimes they're called protocols. But usually they're called bundles. And if you go into a hospital or a nursing home, or a clinic where a procedure is being done, you want to ask, what is the bundle? What is the, what is the punch list? If they don't have one, you might not want to be in that environment. You might want to go somewhere where there is. Now, Pronovost bundle was, was very simple. It was a five-part bundle. Wash your hands using soap or alcohol prior to placing the catheter. That's the insertion uh, tube. Wear sterile gloves, hat, mask, and gown, and completely cover the patient with sterile drapes. Avoid placing the catheter in the groin if possible, as these have a higher infection rate. Clean the insertion site on the patient's skin with chlorhexidine antiseptic solution. For whatever reason, this relatively gentle uh, 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 disinfectant uh, seems to be statistically 
the best at, at, at blocking infections. And finally, remove catheters. Central lines are, are catheters. They're, they're tubes that go into the body when they are no longer needed. Because we know that when catheters, whether they're urinary catheters or whether they're central lines or whether they're other types of lines, the longer they stay in, the more prone we are to infections. So, we, Peter Pronovost learned a lot. And when he applied this to Hopkins, and these are some of the sickest patients who have central lines, infection went to nearly zero. Then he applied it to the entire state of Michigan. Infection went to zero. He applied it to Rhode Island. Infection went to zero. He applied it in Spain. Infection went to zero. He is a great man. He is truly a great man. And he did something similar with people on ventilators or respirators. Very, very sick people. But with protocols, the infection rates, and what kills people on ventilators, by the way, well, they have, they're very sick, but what, what, what kills them is, uh, uh, is infection, usually pneumonia. It can be a fungal infection often, but you want to get them off the ventilator if you possibly can. You don't want to just leave, it, leave them on it. You don't want to make them dependent. And what Peter Pronovost and his team found, uh, your kind, was that uh, people on ventilators don't need to become infected. And if it's not their time, they don't need to die. So he is, he is truly a great person. And what you want when you or your loved one or your friend is in the hospital on a respirator or on a central line, you want to say, What's the bundle? What's the protocol? What's the five-part thing, system, that everybody has to uh, 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 abide by and everybody should know? And if you do that, that's what you're looking for. Doctors, by the way, as we have found again and again, are not universal geniuses. They don't know everything. They can't remember everything about surgery, about uh, uh, pharmaceuticals, about procedures. They have to be part of systems. They have to be part of teams. Now, another very famous case from the uh, uh, late, well, actually it was 1979, involved the Shah of Iran. Many people here are old enough to remember the Shah of Iran. Uh, uh, he uh, actually left Iran uh, for medical care. He had uh, a number of medical problems, including lymphatic cancer. He had enlarged uh, spleen. He had tumors in his neck. Uh, uh, and I don't even think that was the end of it. So what does one of the richest and most powerful men in the world do? He gets the best, the, the world's most famous surgeon to deal with him, a man named Dr. Michael DeBakey. Dr. Michael DeBakey was a tremendous cardiothoracic innovator. He seeded the first artificial heart and many uh, 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 heart prosthetics and valves and so forth, many types of procedures. If you go into a surgical theater, someone may ask for a debakey. A debakey is a type of forceps that uh, he invented. Uh, he won the, the Lasker Award, which is uh, the greatest award that a practicing clinician can win. Nobel Prizes typically go to um, 
uh, uh, researchers, but when you're talking clinicians, physicians, the, the Lasker Award is for a body of great practical application. Well, the, the Shaw needed spleen surgery. And as you may remember, those of you who remember that crisis where there was a revolution in Iran and uh, uh, the radicals under the Ayatollah Khomeini took over and there was um, uh, um, a, uh, uh, an invasion of the United States Embassy in Iran, in Tehran. Well, there were actually two invasions. One was just they went, uh, they went through it and sacked it, these uh, student radicals, young people, and they didn't take any hostages. It was just to show America that uh, we were backing, in their view, the wrong uh, uh, leader. However, the Shah came to the United States, and when that happened, he came to the United States for surgery. When that happened, and uh, that's when the hostages, that's when the, the second invasion of the U.S. Embassy was. It's the reason why it occurred. Uh, the Shah was admitted to the United States for medical care, and they took the hostages. That's the reason. So what did Jimmy Carter do? Uh, among other things, what he did was he kicked the Shah out. The Shah had had uh, uh, some procedures in New York City, but not the main one that he needed. And the Shah started traveling around again, and finally he went to Egypt and had uh, uh, had his surgery there by Dr. Michael DeBakey, caused riots in Egypt for the Shah to be there. Uh, and, uh, but Michael DeBakey was a heart surgeon. He wasn't a general surgeon who did complex gut surgeries. And in doing the surgery, he nicked the Shah's pancreas. That's right, you don't want to do that. And the Shah uh, became inf infected. Uh, uh, he uh, 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 blew up with, uh, he swelled, he had edema with uh, uh, pus and pancreatic pieces. I don't have to go into that. And after a couple of weeks, he died of those complications.